Hello, so this is the, the final lecture, uh, mini lecture. Um, we're gonna look at chapter 13. Um, so uh, chapter 13 is uh, <clears throat> focuses on the quest heroine as, as they define it. And I, I feel sort of mixed feelings about it because one, I think they leave out some quest heroines. Um, I think the heroines in any of the Greek romances uh, like we saw that an Ephesian tale, the heroines there are are very much quest heroines because the romances always involve travel all over the the Roman world, which is like the entire Mediterranean. So, um, you know, also I think Maurizio is trying to fit like a square peg into a round hole sort of thing um, a little bit, but it's it's not a bad chapter. Um, but again, it, it, the fit seems to be a little bit. Uh, strained. So <clears throat> there is a uh, Mauricio cites um, uh, to uh, uh, cl women classical scholars um, who maintain that the heroine's quest, unlike the hero's quest, is to understand the world rather than to conquer it. So that's a that's a sort of a key thing. Um, and one of the other things, you know, at work with the heroine is that the heroine um, as a figure um, comes out <clears throat> as society changes and there's a new style hero and this new hero um, is known for self-sacrificing for the community right that's different than the um, Homeric <clears throat> hero the Homeric hero uh, is all about you know earning fame for himself um, and uh, Medea uh, as a heroine fits that hero type, right? What she's mainly concerned about is her loss of respect. Um, and she's determined to get revenge because of that. Um, which means, you know, like, so heroes can be a threat as well as a, you know, a boon to society. Um, the, the two historical figures of Harmodius and Aristogiton um, are cited by Maurizio. Now, Harmodius and Aristogiton were two young men who um, killed um, one of the tyrants. Um, so they were, it, Athens was ruled by tyrants before it became a democracy. And the tyrant Pisistratus was actually sort of a mixed bag. He was a tyrant, but tyrant in the, in the ancient sense does not necessarily mean a bad ruler. It's a guy with kingly powers who's not a king, right? He wasn't born to it. So, uh, and, and Pisistratus did a lot of good stuff for the city of Athens. His sons, on the other hand, were, were terrible. I mean, they were tyrants in our sense of the word. And um, Harmodes and Aristogiton kill one of the two sons, um, who is technically the ruler, and they're celebrated as heroes. But of course, then uh, they themselves get killed, and the other brother, uh, the other son of uh, Pisistratus, uh, comes to power. But he only rules for a few years before he's driven from power, and then the wheels are set in motion to set up democracy. So Harmodius and Aristogiton were cited as these great heroes because they put their own interests at the service of Athens, right? They, they acted in a way, got them, got them killed, but they did it for the city. They didn't do it sort of for their own glory. Um, so that's also, uh, you know, more likely the woman's path in uh, in stories where the wo where the woman is the hero uh, is that she will do it not sort of for herself but for others. Um, the selection in a ch uh, chapter thirteen, the Greek selection, is from Euripides' play Iphigenia among the Taurians, and this came out in four thirteen, four fourteen, sometime like that. Uh, it comes right after Athens has participated in, in a disastrous naval expedition against Sicily, against the city of Syracuse, which they lost. Um, and so it's a lot of it is, is appealing to the Athenian sense of homecoming and getting the soldiers home after this disastrous um, effort um, miles away. Uh, it is a rescue play. So one of the things about Euripides, we have 19 plays by Euripides. Uh, we have about a quarter of the total plays that he wrote, which is, you know, unusual because we have far fewer. We have only seven plays by Sophocles and six or maybe seven 
from Aeschylus out of you know many more than uh, plays. So the percentage of Euripides is actually quite high relative to the others. Um, four or five of Euripides' 19 plays have happy endings, and this, this play is one of them, uh, and it is a rescue play. So at the beginning of the play, uh, Iphigenia is uh, with the Taurians. She did not get killed at Aulis, but got whooshed off by Artemis to be her priestess uh, in this uh, barbaric land uh, near Colchis, near where Medea lives, uh, at the far side of the, ba the Black Sea. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, she's basically <clears throat> in charge of human sacrifice is sort of what she's in charge of. Um, and her brother Orestes comes looking for her. Um, and it turns out that he's come to rescue her, but ultimately she's the one who's uh, cleverness uh, gets them all rescued um, so it sort of turns things on its head it's similar to the play Helen uh, which is also by Euripides where Menelaus ends up in Egypt uh, it turns out that Helen didn't go to Troy uh, rather like an image of her went to Troy whereas the real Helen was in Egypt the entire time and uh, Menelaus um, means to rescue her but it's Helen uh, by her cleverness who actually gets Menelaus and Helen rescued from uh, the Egyptian ruler. Um, so the heroine does the rescuing, right? So it's a, and we, if you've seen Disney films from Beauty and the Beast on, uh, Disney animated films, uh, it's often the, the, they flip the damsel in distress thing on its head, where, where it's the woman who either saves herself or saves everyone um, instead of relying on a man to do that. The scholarship deals with the quest heroine and what are the quest heroine's qualities. Um, so um, the protagonist in a quest heroine story does not follow the usual feminine story. So the usual feminine story would be uh, the girl grows up, she gets married, she has children. Right? That's, the, that's the typical pattern. And there are some heroines, Greek heroines, who fit that pattern. Uh, Alcmena, the mother of Hercules, uh, Andromache, the wife of Hector, um, these fit that pattern. Um, and that's the approved path for women. Quest heroines, um, are, the focus is not on them getting married, is not on them uh, subordinating themselves to a man. Um, they're usually their own person, and that's not the usual feminist story. But they're not like Medea, who's more like a Greek hero, a, a male hero, um, the uh, um, quest heroines are leaders with moral and intellectual authority. They're often the smartest people in the room, and they're also the people whose moral compass is correct. So in the Iphigenia among the Taurians, it really requires Iphigenia's smarts to get them saved. Um, it, it turns out that Orestes is not much of a hero himself. Um, and um, as Mauricio points out, very few fit this pattern. Uh, Iphigenia fits this pattern. Um, the figure of Psyche in the story of Cupid and Psyche. Now, Psyche is not really a, a heroine in the sense of the word of, like, there's a shrine to her. Um, she may have some uh, reality in history. Uh, Psyche, of course, just means the soul. And the story of Cupid and Psyche is actually the story. It's an allegory for love and the soul. Um, so Psyche is not really a real person. There isn't a shrine to Psyche. Uh, but Psyche um, and Cupid fall in love. They get separated. And then Psyche has to um, somehow win back Cupid. So again, this is the, the woman is taking the active role here and not waiting for stuff to happen. Um, Maritzia also, or actually the, the, the scholar here, um, considers heroines like Iphigenia and, um, and Psyche as marginals instead of outsiders. So outsiders would be figures um, that would fit Van Gennep's schema. Remember Van Gennep's schema, 
it's it's uh, rituals of elevation where you go from one status to another status. So, you know, the Brauronia, right? Girls go to Brauron, they get separated from their normal routine, get separated from their families. They do the ritual, and then after they've done the ritual, they give up their toys and so forth. They, they are basically saying goodbye to childhood, and then when they return home, they're soon going to get married. So they're moving on to another stage. Okay, that's an outsider. The girls are outside um, you know, social conformity. They're not part of society. They're wild things, right? That's the way they're viewed in the Brauron uh, Festival. But they are going to become part of society, right? So there's that movement from outside to inside. Marginals are outside society, but they do not act as if they really care about whether they're admitted to society. So it's not like you know, they want to be part of society and they're going to do what they have to. Rather, they're going to be their own person. Um, and that happens to be outside of the society and they're sort of okay with that. The um, comparison section is actually a Christian selection. Um, it deals uh, with uh, a, a woman named Thecla, who I think in the Greek Orthodox Church is a, is a saint, um, but I'm not sure about that. Um, and the story of Thecla comes from a, uh, a Christian work that did not make it into the New Testament, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Um, the Acts are just, the, this, all of the stories that are the Acts of, and there's more than just these two, um, they basically deal with um, people after Christ has sort of, uh, uh, you know, had his life, died, and, and risen and gone to heaven. Um, what the apostles and the other disciples do after that, right? So the Acts of the Apostles, which is in the New Testament, is one such thing. And the Acts of Paul and Thecla uh, would be another. So it's basically following Paul around, but it's focused on the figure of Thecla, who uh, sees Paul, basically decides she wants to be a Christian and wants to be a lot like Paul. But the interesting thing in, in the Acts of Paul and Thecla is that, that Paul... Um, Seems, seems to be almost unaware of Thecla herself. So Thecla has to actually do a lot of the heavy lifting of sainthood by herself. Um, so it's, it's sort of an interesting, so she's a lot like Iphigenia. It, it, it really comes down to her, not her depending on some man. Um, and um, what this section also talks about is that as Christianity became more and more an important part of uh, the Roman state, uh, became an accepted part by the fourth century. Um, saints were seen through the lens of heroes, and I had mentioned that before, right? So these are great figures. They've done great things. Um, they've died. There's a shrine uh, in their honor. Now, in Christianity, of course, there's only one God, and uh, and there's there's Christ who's seen as part of God. Saints are actually on a lower level, but if you if you've you know, grown up Catholic or even some other Christian faiths, uh, oftentimes, you know, the churches are, you know, the church, St. Paul's church, St. Peter's church, St., you know, um, Anne's church, um, St. Elizabeth's church, right, those are, and they're basically hero stories, uh, but they're hero stories within the Christian setting, so, but they're the new type of, you know, hero, the hero that does stuff for the community rather than for doing it for themselves, right, because Christianity not supposed to be big on ego, right? Um, theoretically. Uh, and the Nachleben section uh, is entitled 20 Years of Iphigenia in New York City. Uh, and it looks at two plays uh, that were uh, off-Broadway plays, one by Charles Mee called Iphigenia 2.0, which is a reworking of the Iphigenia at Aulis story. But here it's not the goddess Artemis who, who calls for Iphigenia's sacrifice. It's actually the Greek army, uh, and this story is is done by um, is also done by Barry Powell, who translated the uh, uh, the Iliad uh, uh, and the Odyssey uh, uh, selections uh, in the in the book, and also the Aeneid selections in the in the Maristio's book. Um, he, he wrote a novel um, called the the Songs of the Kings, I think is what it's called, um, which tells the Iphigenia story. But in that, um, it's Odysseus who engineers the army to, to uh, call for 
a sacrifice of Iphigenia as a way of sort of getting back at Agamemnon. Um, so it's more like a looking at the at public relations and how public relations can be twisted, public opinion can be twisted by uh, clever schemers. Um, so um, the, the, this Iphigenia has that same sort of pattern. And then there's uh, Mickey, I guess it's Mickey Barali, um, who I think is the is the wife or was the wife of Charles Me, um, uh, rescue me. And this is the ret retelling of the Iphigenia. It's all a story uh, where Iphigenia here is actually a an immigration official um, who processes um, uh, immigrants with a view to basically getting them sent back to their country. So <clears throat> it's sort of a way of, a, a, in the modern world, does that constitute as a form of human sacrifice? Because in the Iphigenia among the Taurians, um, you know, Iphigenia, her job is actually, in this barbaric land, is to um, sacrifice uh, foreigners, especially Greek foreigners, um, and is presented as um, by the king uh, of the Taurians as Iphigenia should be glad of this because they were willing to sacrifice her so she can return the favor. Um, now, of course, she rejects that, as does the, the, the heroine in uh, Rescue Me. She, you know, um, eventually, you know, stops doing this processing of humans and, and sacrificing them to the system. So um, that sort of covers chapter 13. Um, the uh, things to make sure that you get done, you know, uh, in the coming weeks, make sure you get the, uh, the Aeneid paper done. Um, that's supposed to be five pages, so that'd be 1,500 words or more. Um, you know, you have lots of citations, uh, and I urge you probably to follow the, the, the selections given. So pick one of the heroes, Dido, Turnus, or Aeneas, and look at how they represent the hero. What, what makes them a hero in the work? Um, what are their qualities? What's their cardinal quality, their chief quality? Um, and, or look at like how the gods are presented and how the gods interact with humans in, in, uh, um, in the Aeneid. Uh, but you wanna get that done because that's like worth a double paper and it's not gonna get dropped. So if you, if you miss this, it's gonna really hurt your score. Um, and then we've got the final, which is just a test over the last three chapters. I think it's the last three chapters and the Aeneid. Um, but, um, you know, at any rate, uh, I've, I've enjoyed the class. I've, uh, some, a lot of your comments in the discussion boards have actually been, you know, very good, very insightful. It looks like many of you put some time into that, which is good. I'm, you know, the discussion boards, you don't need to necessarily put a lot of time into it, but it is nice that you put some thought into it. Um, I mean, I appreciate that. I think the more you think about the stuff, the more you learn the stuff. So I think that's all to the good. So I hope you guys uh, have a great, uh, a great um, uh, summer. Um, and um, if you have any questions, of course, uh, just send me if something in Canvas. That's that's the best way to communicate with me is is to do that. Um, and uh, you know, look at your scores. If you're borderline and need some extra credit points, there are the extra credit papers uh, that you can work on. Those just have to be a couple of pages, um, and those. Um, you know, the po possible number of points is uh, is 20 for each of those. Um, so you can make up some points, like if you missed a test or you only did one of the essays, you can make that up largely by, by getting those pa those uh, essays in, uh, those um, extra credit papers in. So um, I'm gonna cut it short now, or I, I'm gonna end it now, it's, it's already a little bit longer. Uh, and again, wish you a good summer uh, and a great life. <laughs>